thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, you know, introducing me. I mean, it's it's really uh, it has been a great uh, association with you for the last so many years, and uh, and today also I would like to thank you for a nice uh, and kind introduction. I would like to thank AIOS and Santin for having me in this uh, webinar, uh, wherein we have such wonderful speakers and uh, two stalwarts as moderators. Uh, I would like to you know, present on uh, management strategies of bacterial keratitis. Now, the approach towards management for any infectious disorder is to assess the severity first. And it is uh, not just to know the severity, but uh, as uh, uh, we all understand that you know, severity, uh, it, it guides our treatment as well. The biggest thing, the most important thing that we have to do in infectious or microbial keratitis is to identify the organism, either clinically or by investigations or by both. And then only we can have an appropriate antimicrobials for eradicating the organism. And while treating, sometimes we overshoot our, uh, our aim. We give a lot of drugs, so we have to minimize, we have to be judicious, so minimize drug toxicity as well. And if needed, if nothing is working and the cornea has perforated, then we have to resort to some surgical management. Now, assessing the severity is very important. It is not just theoretical thing that we have to assess and we have to know whether it's a mild ulcer or a moderate or severe, but uh, uh, the treatment also depends on it. And many of the cornea surgeons believe that, you know, uh, we, although there are studies comparing uh, you know, comparable results of monotherapy with combination therapy, but uh, in we use uh, monotherapy in mild ulcers, but in moderate and severe, we use uh, a, a combination for uh, therapy of uh, fortified antibiotics. So, so grading of corneal ulcer is important, clinically very much relevant in terms of management of ulcer. As I said earlier, that identifying the organism is actually the key because we have to have the we have to use the appropriate antimicrobials. And that can be a, uh, ascertained by, by knowing the history, by having the history, associated event, whether there was a trauma, trauma with, a, with any specific thing, whether there was a history of any surgery. So all these factors, they guide us to a great extent to clinch the, the uh, organism. Of course, by clinical examination, we can assess, we can have an idea of the organism if the patient comes in an early stage, but once it is very advanced, it becomes difficult. And of course, by investigations, we, uh, we confirm the type of organism in majority, uh, of course, not in all. Say, for example, if there is a post lasic keratitis and the keratitis has come up uh, in uh, you know, a couple of weeks, the first thing that comes to the mind is atypical mycobacterium. And this is what this is why we all discuss and we do the literature review because you immediately start thinking because you know thousands of uh, keratitis reported in the literature, if they have shown that you know this is the most common organism or the typical organism, then we have to investigate keeping this in mind and have our direction in uh, you know keep our uh, ourselves in that direction. So uh, as I said, atypical mycobacterium or staphylococcus or pseudomonas, or they can be polymicrobial infection as well. And this is what has been reported in the ACRS survey. Now, if we have a, a, an event of a, a surgical event of an intracornal ring segment, and there is an infection in that, if there's a keratitis, then again, we would like to know what are the organisms that affect more. And in literature, it states that the gram-positive cocci are the most frequently uh, frequent organisms causing uh, post-intact keratitis. So we have to uh, take ourselves in that direction, investigate accordingly. Infection after CXL has been reported with many organisms, and we have to keep investigating for all these organisms. Post-penetrating keratoplasty, it's a gram-positive cocci that is most commonly uh, implicated. We also have done a few studies in that. And so we direct ourselves in that uh, direction. Infectious crystalline keratopathy, post-lamellar keratoplasty, post-lase, maybe because of alpha hemolytic streptococci or staph. Post-lamellar keratoplasty keratitis, like post-DSEC or post-anterior lamellar keratitis. 
uh, anterior lamellar keratoplasty keratitis. It is also called interface infectious keratitis or a sandwich infectious keratitis because it is like a sandwich. We have the corneal tissue on two sides and infiltrate in between. And mostly it starts in the interface, starts from the donor tissue and moves towards the host. And the organisms that have been reported in a couple of studies, which have done, this is a review article by Fontana et al. And they have found out that in majority of studies, it's the fungal infection that is the more common. Apart from that, actinomyces, mycobacterium, klebsiella, and staph have been found to be, uh, uh, you know, the causative organism. And donor rim culture has given the maximum yield as far as organism is concerned. If it's an immunocompromised individual, like HIV positive individuals, you can have polymicrobial infection, you can have staph, you can have fungal, particularly in immunocompromised, it is candida. And we reported this uh, series of patients of uh, post antiretroviral therapy where the patient developed uh, ocular surface disorder and there was uh, uh, infection, keratitis. And we found out that in majority of cases, it was staphylococcus and acanth amoeba. In bullous keratopathy, since there is a reduction in local immunity, we can have infection by commensals and we can have infection by streptococcus or staphylococcus. We, are, we also use bandage contact lens. That can also be a factor. Long-term uh, use of bandage contact lens can lead to infection. Contact lens induce infectious keratitis. If it's, you know, if the patient gives a history that he uses contact lens, he slept with contact lens, he, he uh, swam using, uh, he, did, he went into the swimming pool with the contact lens on, we can suspect uh, you know, these organisms. If it's a very, very rapid, uh, uh, a very rapid uh, 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 course with ring ulcer like this, it can be pseudomonas. But if it's a slightly lesser uh, rapid course, again, having ring ulcer, et cetera, one can think in terms of acanthamoeba. So uncommon organisms like staph, fusarium, et cetera, can also cause infection. So we have to direct ourselves in these directions. So that is the reason why the event and the literature search gives you uh, some idea that, you know, you have to uh, keep your direction in, in, in this line. Then clinical diagnostic clues are also very useful. Like gram-positive cocci, they typically produce localized round or oval ulceration with distinct borders. While gram-negative organisms, they have some uh, edema surrounding the uh, ulcer and they have ill-defined borders. So this gives you an, uh, some idea that probably it is because of uh, gram-positive or gram-negative organism. Pneumococcus can give rise to a serpiginous ulcer. If there's a serpiginous ulcer, you can think in those directions. Of course, AC reaction is quite high in that. Pseudomonas will have ring infiltrate, can have very rapid course. There is stromal melting. Also, uh, it's mainly because it also releases exotoxins, which release collagenases, and that cause, causes stromal melting. So pseudomonas can uh, give rise to a very fast uh, 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 perforation of corneal ulcer. Nocardia is a little indolent. It simulates fungal, uh, can give rise to a wreath-like pattern or a cracked windshield appearance. So if we have this kind of, uh, these pictures, then we direct ourselves and investigate accordingly. Further, microbiological investigation is the key because it, proves it actually gives you the proper proof that this is the organism. Sampling of the organism, sampling of the tissue can be done by corneal scraping, by, by AC tap, by vitreous tap, by bunch biopsy, by suture biopsy. And you can do various stains uh, to identify the organism, whether it's a gram positive or a gram negative, then various cultures wherein we prefer doing direct plating to the culture media. Scraping is usually done under topical anesthesia, except if it's a very small child wherein we require sedation or general anesthesia. And as far as instrument is concerned, we use chimera spatula or surgical blade number 15 for uh, scraping. We use various stains, stains, the gram stains for gram, knowing the gram uh, positive or gram negative uh, organism. We can have use acid fast stain for, uh, for these atypical organisms. Then bacterial cultures can be done on blood agar, chocolate agar, and uh, direct plating is preferred. Biopsy can be done if there is culture negativity on two or more than two occasions. Now, why culture becomes negative? It can be because of sterile ulcer, or there is a prior partial antibiotic treatment, and that is one reason. So we have to stop the antibiotic treatment for 24 hours and then do a scraping, or there's inadequate sampling, 
or there can be improper selection of the media or incubation, or there is false interpretation of data. And if at all we have more than two times uh, uh, negativity of the scraping, then we may have to do a corneal biopsy by uh, using dermal trephines and uh, we can get a tissue for corneal biopsy and get the appropriate uh, organism detected. Now, once we detect the appropriate organism, we have to do the drug therapy. As I mentioned earlier, the, the preferred choice is a combination therapy of fortified antibiotic, fortified kefazolin 5% and tobramycin 1.4%. Uh, the gram-positive uh, organisms are taken care of by cephalosporins and the gram-negative organisms, actinomyces, atypical mycobacteria, etc., are covered by aminoglucosides. Monotherapy is also useful, as I said earlier. Chloroquinolones can be used, the newer generation. They are effective against pseudomonas as well. And there are a couple of studies which have compared garifloxacin and moxifloxacin with uh, combination therapy of fortified drugs, and they found it to be comparable. However, there's a general consensus amongst most of the ophthalmologists in the cornea, cornea, uh, cornea specialists that if it's a mild ulcer less than two millimeter of ulcer, we can go ahead with the fluoroquinolone. But if it's a moderate and severe ulcer, we prefer using combination therapy. Now, currently we, uh, we are having higher concentration of fluoroquinolones like 0.5% GATI or 1.5% levofloxacin about which we will be discussed in subsequent talks. So they are quite effective in uh, moderate and severe uh, ulcers as well. In post lasic keratitis, apart from the routine treatment that we follow for any bacterial keratitis, uh, flap amputation is something which is required in order to have a good resolution of the keratitis. And uh, for atypical mycobacteria, amikacin 2.5%, clarithromycin 1%, or, or even the newer generation fluoroquinolones can be effective. In post intracorneal ring segment keratitis, if it occurs, say, uh, a week or 10 days after, after uh, the uh, ring segment implantation, we, and if it has started from the area of the suture, which I had shown in the earlier picture, then we can remove the suture and send it for culture. That will help us to know the organism. Uh, ring segment removal can be avoided in some cases by doing the channel irrigation. But in many cases, we have to remove the ring segment if it doesn't respond, particularly if the infiltrates are present in the bed of the ring segment. And the, these, these are quite severe and, they, and such cases, if delayed, may require even therapeutic grafts in, uh, subsequently. Post lamellar keratoplasty, post anterior lamellar or DSEG or ADEMIC, which is, inter uh, which is interface uh, or a sandwich infectious keratitis, in that we have to give combination topical antimicrobials. And uh, if it's a fungal infection, then we have to give systemic antifungals. But medical treatment alone is not very much successful in majority. And we have to intervene surgically. And the minimal that we have to do is to remove the lenticule first, because most of the times it comes from the donor lenticule. So you have to remove the lenticule and then intracameral or intravitreal or interface or interstomal antimicrobials can be used to look for the response. But in many of the cases, we if there is a, a marked in, a infection, then excisional therapeutic PK has to be done in order to get a good response. If it's a keratitis, which is the healing phase, then we have to reduce the frequency. Uh, we have to uh, lessen it in order to, uh, we don't have to taper it, but we have to abruptly reduce it in order to uh, reduce the toxicity of the drug. We may add preservative free lubricants uh, in order to improve epithelization and reduce supportive therapy to, re to reduce drug toxicity. Steroids can be used once the infiltrates have started reducing because it, we have to be very careful in using steroid, very judicious. Uh, if you use it excessively, it can cause tumor melting, it can cause a recalcitrant infection. So we have to be judicious. We have to be sure that the infiltrates are reducing and then we use steroid to reduce it further, to reduce the inflammation. Systemic antibiotic is preferred when there is perforation or impending perforation, or where there's uh, scleral limbal involvement, or where there's virulent organism. And the drugs uh, do require change if there is no response of the initial treatment, and the culture sensitivity shows that the bacteria is sensitive to some other antibiotic. But even if the culture sensitivity is showing otherwise, as Bam was also mentioning, Dr. Savitri was mentioning that you, know, you can have a difference in the in vitro in vivo 
uh, sensitivity, if the sensitivity is there, if the uh, ulcer is responding, then we don't have to change the antibiotic. The uh, progression of ulceration and perforation is basically due to resistant strain or virulent organism or inappropriate medication, or there's poor compliance uh, by the patient, and if excessive steroid drops have been used uh, early. And if there is a small perforation like this, or if there's an impending perforation or a fistula, then uh, which is less than two millimeter, we can use a small droplet of uh, uh, cyanoacrylate glue. We can use a filter paper over it to have a controlled spread of the uh, glue. And then uh, we can put a bandage contact lens over it. And that will work uh, quite effectively. But if the uh, perforation is a little bigger, and of this size, wherein the glue is not going to work, then we have to do a patch graft. And uh, once we have done a patch graft, after that also, we have to uh, continue the antibiotic therapy in order to uh, maintain the response uh, uh, and in order to have a proper resolution of the drug. These are some of the post-op pictures. And if the uh, perforation is central, if it's a large perforation, large ulcer, then we have to do a full thickness uh, therapeutic graft. And uh, we have to ensure that the infiltrates are completely removed, not only from the cornea, but also from the anterior segment, uh, from the anterior chamber. And we have to be careful in maintaining the anterior chamber by use of viscoelastic, so that uh, because there is risk of peripheral anterior synechia formation in these cases and secondary glaucoma because of a high uh, inflammation. So, and for the same reason, we uh, prefer using a higher graft force disparity of 0.75 or one millimeter instead of 0.5 millimeter when we are doing uh, therapeutic keratoplasty for a perforated corneal ulcer. So in conclusion, bacterial keratitis is an ocular emergency and we have to be very meticulous, but very fast in our approach towards diagnosis and management. The key to management is to detect the infective uh, is, uh, microorganism and aggressive and early treatment is important. And if things are not working, then sometimes we do have to resort to surgical management in the form of uh, in, in the form of cyanoacrylate glue or patch graft or a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you.